Morning, everybody. I uh, welcome you who are joining us online. I always want you to know we are grateful for you, but I'm particularly grateful for those of you who showed up on this Time Change Sunday. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, it's tough like these uh, days as you get a little older. And so uh, <laughs> the next service won't laugh at me when I say that. But nonetheless, I'm trusting that uh, God's going to just guide and, and minister in this moment in spite of the hour less sleep and the time changes and all that kind of stuff. For those of you who are online, you actually missed a little bit at the very beginning. We went through um, uh, an ancient prayer actually called St. Patrick's uh, Breastplate, I Arise Today. And we had some bookmarks that, that we went through uh, with that. And you could Google that if, if you like uh, online and then you can look up and see what it is. Uh, the last paragraph of that is something I pray regularly and actually quite often, in fact, pretty much like every Sunday before you show up uh, as a means to just kind of settle in and say, Jesus, you reign here in this place. But in my journey of faith, uh, I mean, you got those heroes, right? Obviously, you have Jesus, who we're going to talk a lot about in the moments to come. And then you've got like, you know, Paul and Peter and, you know, kind of giants like that. But for me, in all honesty, St. Patrick is like number four. Like, I, that's how much I love the story and the account of St. Patrick, and uh, Pastor Ashley shared a little bit about it already. I'm going to give you a couple more details as a means to kind of process where we're, we're heading here in, in just a moment. And this is just like a snippet, and, and it, I mean, this is a, uh, you know, almost, not quite 2,000 years ago, under 2,000, but it's, it's a long time ago, and so some of this is legend, and you have to do a little bit of reading and what have you, but what's really cool for me about the story and the account of St. Patrick is that he was was taken as a slave to Ireland um, from, you know, Romania, Britannia. He was taken to that place as a slave. He escaped via visions is what the legend tells us. Um, some even say angelic messengers and then would go back to kind of his home in Britannia and, and speak with the Roman Catholic Church because that was the only church in that era in that time and spoke of how he now had a heart to go back to Ireland and share who Jesus was and the hope that he brings to the people that had enslaved him as a, as a child and as a younger man. And so they sent him back as a missionary, if you will, um, because he was too old to start like the process of becoming, you know, a priest or what have you. And, and the goal was to start the Roman Catholic Church of Ireland. That was kind of what he was sent to do. However, as he got there and he interacted with these people who, um, you know, he had spent those years with, he knew that like setting up some like massive, you know, beacon that's supposed to represent God and his light and his presence and what have you wasn't going to work. And so he broke away from tradition. He broke away from like the systems and structures of the Roman Catholic Church and instead went to a little village or a little community or a little clan, if you will, and shared the good news of Jesus and began to gain some headway. And he would start this little house or this little kind of you know, home of prayer and worship. And over the course of, you know, a season, many, most in fact, in that little clan or that village or that community would come to know Jesus. And then he would leave them and he'd move on to the next one. And again, not start something big and lap, just start this little house or this little home, this simple structure of prayer and worship. And again, reach many, reach most, and then move on. And throughout the course of doing this, he reached like pretty much the whole island with the hope of Jesus. He goes back and reports to the Roman Catholic Church in Britannia at the time, and they're like, you did what? We told you to start the Roman Catholic Church of Ireland, and you started simple houses of prayer and worship? What? And they're like, they were just completely furious with him, and they even ostracized him for a season. It took Years, decades, in fact, for them to even recognize the significance of what he did because he broke away from a system and a structure to best reach people who were unreached. I love that part. There's way more to the story than that, but I love that he was willing to do what others weren't to reach people who weren't reached. I love that kind of stuff. I mean, that kind of stuff, you know, fires me up, actually. And, you know, I'm just like, whew, man, 
how good is that? Um, on a complete side note, please feel no pressure to follow through on what I'm about to say. Although later on with things I want to say, I encourage you to follow through. Um, <laughs> But uh, on St. Patrick's Day, actually, the Fort Cinema is bringing in a film called Jesus Revolution. You don't have to like it. I like it. Um, but it's a story of, you know, doing unconventional things to reach people who weren't reached. And uh, I personally really enjoyed it. And uh, it's a, you know, opportunity to support a local business and, uh, you know, see a good Good, what I think is a good show anyway. And it's on St. Patrick's Day is when it comes out for the week. So I just wanted to make sure you knew about that opportunity because it's, again, a story of, you know, reaching the unreached with means that weren't, you know, maybe normal or uh, seen as, um, you know, uh, the proper way to do things. Now, speaking of that, um, the Alliance is actually up to something that I find uh, just completely motivational as well. Um, they are up to uh, a work at an area in our, of our world where they are, are coming up with new ways with another organization to reach those who aren't reached. I love, I'm so, I mean proud in a good way. I'm so proud to be a part of a family of churches that is thinking this way, that is coming outside of the, the previous you know, means and ways of reaching people um, to bring the good news of, of who uh, Jesus is is. And, and what's really cool is in this particular area of the world, and if you want to learn more, please ask me one-on-one. -on -one. I'm happy to share more. Um, in this particular uh, area of the world, uh, we're working with another organization who's raising up locals. I love this. And, and in the midst of raising up locals, there's a 10-year goal to start 100,000 churches. That's cool. Like, that's big. Like, that's swinging for the fences. I love that kind of stuff. 100,000 churches. And to do that with a simple means in the midst of houses of prayer and worship with locals. I got a video that I'm going to show uh, about this and then talk a little bit more about it. So let's roll it. Priya is a young and passionate woman, trained and equipped in an empath transformation center. Heeding to the call of the lost and needy, she dedicated herself quite early in life for ministry. Today, she's vibrantly taking the gospel to the unreached in her region. I continued and I being a woman, Priya visits women, mingles with them and prays for them. This way, she is able to relate to the women in this region much better. Many families are being blessed through her ministry. Let us continue to stand with her and uphold her in our prayers as she serves the Lord faithfully. Come on now, that's cool. Hey? And not only that, so like, I'm, I was, as most of you know, and if you don't, I'm telling you right now, uh, I was in Indonesia at the beginning uh, of the year, hanging out with a number of our IWs from all over that kind of Southeast Asia part of the world. And, and I was meeting with, with people who were specifically overseeing things in this area. And this is like a crazy audacious goal and a completely different way of, of mission, uh, if you will. But as they were sharing with me, they, they told me some things that are crazy. In just the first few years of, of this effort partnering with these other, uh, this other organization, there has been 12,000 pastors trained at these schools. 12,000. They've already started 40,000 churches. How cool is that? 
That's amazing. God is on the move. Like he is up to something. And in areas of the world where they are desperate for God, he's moving. I think what we have to think about for us is how desperate are we? And how desperate are we? I'm convinced that whether it's St. Patrick or Priya, right, uh, they got the why, didn't they? They know Jesus is above all. We've been talking about that for the first few weeks of going through Colossians. They knew he was above all. And with everything that was within them, they wanted to ensure others got to meet Jesus, who is above all. And we take this beautiful turn today in the book of Colossians where not only is he above all and not only have there been people of faith, um, you know, hundreds of years ago to just this very day in other parts of the world who've recognized that, embraced that, and come up with amazing things. They also know that as we make this turn, he's not only above all, he's also in you. And this is game changing, no matter what and even when it's hard. And the text we talk about and we're going to look at today will we'll bring that out uh, to life for us. So we're going to pick up in Colossians chapter 1. And uh, I'm going to read actually 24 down through chapter 2, verse 5. And then we're going to go back and really kind of settle in on the first part, okay? So this is the text uh, that we're going to read through today. Chapter uh, 1, verse 24 to 2, verse 5. And then we're going to unpack it a bit. So let me read it for you. Paul writing here, I am glad when I suffer, (laughs) that's interesting, for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and the glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and the church at Laodicea. And for many other believers who have never met me personally, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. This starts off really interesting, doesn't it? The, The opening line of our text today is we've established that Christ is above all is I am glad when I suffer for you. Ah! I don't know about you, but I have my moments when it comes to suffering. Moments when it is difficult to say, I'm glad. But nonetheless, here Paul is stating this, I'm glad. And I think it's because he's wrestled with them through some things and also settled on some things that are really important. Now, there are tensions when we come to Scripture, and I recognize that, and I've mentioned it before, but I think it's important to establish this when we go through that. And one of the tensions is suffering. And, and probably you have heard or even asked people, you know, with questions like, you know, if God is great, why doesn't he just end suffering? Or if God is good, you know, why doesn't he just alleviate it? And, and, and those are questions that, I think are normal, that they're okay to ask. In fact, that they're important to ask and to wrestle through to to figure out. But as you've heard me say before, I'm convinced that the scriptures give us some light into this. 
And that the sufferings we speak of aren't so much, you know, evidence against God as they are against the evidence against us. For the, the very scriptures that we, you know, we read, we go through, start off with this creation account where the great almighty God creates. And then he declares, it is good. As it was intended and designed and created by him, it was without defect, without fault. Perfect. This all shifted not because of God and choices that he made. This actually shifted because of humanity. A rebellion, if you will, against what he had asked. <laughs> and thus enters sin, death, what we often refer to as the fall. And so very often, our suffering isn't so much <laughs> evidence against God as it is the evidence that we live in this fallen world, infected with sin. And it's hard. And it hurts. But God didn't want to leave us in the midst of this suffering. So he entered the story himself. Jesus came as a means to bring reconciliation, which we've talked about in the previous weeks. He came in the midst of the suffering. And so the question that I think we need to really ask about suffering isn't why God, but how will we allow suffering to affect us? From the perspective of, of Paul, it appears <laughs> that he's willing to invest suffering. Think about that. He's actually willing to invest suffering. Let me unpack that a little further. I was actually um, out for lunch this past week with Fred and Lou, who are new to our community, new to our church, but uh, have long ties with the Alliance. And we were having a visit, and the visit um, included some conversation around suffering. And here's the thing. It's not my story to tell right now, so I'm not. But the reality is, is we all have faced some sort of suffering, haven't we? And they said something in the midst of that conversation that really really hit me, and I think it's important for us to consider in the midst of the text and as we're processing it today, and it's this. They said this, you got two choices. You can either invest your suffering or you can squander it. It's up to you. You can invest suffering or you can squander it. I think another way we could look at it is like this. We can allow our suffering to sanctify us. What that means is to become more like Jesus. We can allow our suffering to help us to become more like Jesus. Or we can allow it to make us cynical. Because all of us are going to suffer at some point. It's part of the human experience. And Paul is no exception. Like, the guy who writes you know, half the New Testament, of all the people you think would have an in with Jesus, it would be Paul, but here he is suffering. And, and, and to be fair, unjustly suffering. Like he's suffering for speaking of God. Like it's not a just suffering, it's an unjust suffering, isn't it? And in the midst of unjust suffering, he's made this conscious choice to invest rather than squander. To allow it to be a part of his sanctification rather than be cynical. And so I think a uh, question for us then is, as we are, you know, confronted with the reality of the fall and the suffering that life does bring, invest or squander? You know, sanctified or cynical? Now that doesn't make it easier. <laughs> and you're going to have your moments. We all do, don't we? You're going to have those moments where you just scream out in frustration and anger. But there's a mindset that Paul has here. And I think what's really important in the midst of this mindset is understand that he has this mindset because he knows Jesus is above all. And if Jesus is above all, he can leverage it for some type of investment of good. He can leverage it for some type of, uh, 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 of sanctification uh, type process. Will we let him? Paul's this prisoner unjustly uh, 
you know, in chains and suffering. His enemies would no doubt look to like scoff. His opponents would leverage this to, to, to minimize the message, but not for Paul. For him, it was the opportunity to invest. So which will it be for us? As I was thinking about suffering, sometimes we have these celebratory moments, just like, you know, whatever that was five, ten minutes ago, as we thought about Priya. And how cool is it that there's 12,000 pastors and 40,000 churches in the last few years? But part of the story I hadn't yet told is this. Many of those pastors are beaten regularly. Many of those pastors are being ripped away from families and thrown in jail. There's been a number of them who've actually been killed for the sake of this gospel message. And so this isn't just something that Paul experienced 2,000 years ago. This is something that happens in our world today. But for the people in this other part of the world, there seems to be an understanding that Jesus is above all and it's worth it. So they'll invest. That Jesus is above all so they'll allow it to you, have them become more like him or to sanctify them. Because they want the hope of the message of who Jesus is to come through to all. Now, how do you press in in scenarios like that? <laughs> well, Paul keeps going. God has given me this responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message for you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it's been revealed to God's people. I love this idea of keeping this message, it's message secret. It's kind of like this like big plot in a movie, right? And uh, in the midst of my scripture reading and what have you, uh, I just so happen to find myself in the middle of the book of Leviticus, fun. And within it, I continually have to remind myself to look for Jesus and to look for how it's showing or foreshadowing who Jesus was. And as you read Leviticus, you see again and again and again that blood is being shed. It's this endless process of sacrifices in order to just cover up our guilt. But in Jesus, as we've talked about 1 verse 20, God, he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by the means of Christ's blood on the cross. 22, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ and his physical body. A sacrifice once and for all has been made, not just to cover, but now to cleanse. This is the message that Paul, that Priya, that we're invited to be desperate to take out and share. And we're reminded that this message of Jesus' blood that was shed comes on the heels for us of establishing who he is in 15 and 16, that Christ Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation Jesus came into the midst of the mess, into the midst of the suffering, the visible image of the invisible God, and he met with Paul, and he wants to meet with you. Every single one of you. And he wants to meet with you, wherever it is that you watch this now. And he would suffer more than any in all of history by taking on the consequence and the effects of all of our sin. Separating him from relationship with the Father for the one and only moment in all of history that he could shed his blood, that we could be cleansed. Cleansed of our guilt, cleansed of our shame, cleansed of our fears, made new. He longs to do that in us. And if and when we come to that place where we say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus, 
forgive me. My life here, it's yours. Something happens where we take the first step of saying, I'll be an investor. Now, I'll, I'll be sanctified. I will come under your rule and leadership, Jesus. Take me and use me. Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, my life is yours. Now, that sounds daunting, I know. That Jesus, my life is your part. But the secret message that Paul speaks of brings it fully into the light how we can have the capacity to have that investment style mindset. How we can have the capacity to have this set apart or sanctified mindset. It reads like this. For God wanted them to know that the riches and the glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing in his glory. Jesus is above all. And he's in you. And so it is okay to ask the questions about suffering and say, why? Why, God? If you are good, if you are great, why? But I think the more important question is how? How can God use that in the world that has fallen? Not by his fault, but by ours. To help us have an investment mindset, to have a sanctified mindset. And so the question that I do leave with you that I hope you consider is this. You can invest or you can squander. How would you like to be known? You can be sanctified or you can be cynical. How do you want to live? Whether it's in regards to suffering in general or whether it's in regards to life as a whole. Investing or squandering, sanctified or cynical, which comes through in your day-to-day -day life for you? We've been making a habit of taking some time to read scripture and to set a place, a, a space for us to just meditate on it, to talk to God about it, to allow him to speak to us through it. Um, one of the tools that we've recently started using in our Hearing God sessions, which is our sessions um, with our, our elders and our staff and our, our, our small group leaders, um, is a tool called Campus. It's an acronym that just asks some questions that allows us to help meditate on scripture. And so like the questions uh, just come from that, that word campus. So like, they're like this, you know, what's that, what's the command you have for me in the scripture, God? What's the application you have for me? Is there a message here for me? What's the promise you have for me? Is there something you want me to further understand in the scripture today? Or is there sin that you need to bring to light that I need to deal with? And so as we think about which comes through in our life, I want to just read this passage one more time. I'm just going to read uh, 24 to 29. And I'm going to read it from uh, the message version here. and Just invite you to look for something that stands out, that's highlighted, that's illuminated, if you will. And then kind of ask those questions. Maybe just pick one or go through all of them. It's up to you. And see what God wants to kind of show and uh, work through with you today. So look for what stands out, what jumps off the page, and then ask a campus question with God. I'll give you some space to do that. Here it is. I want you to know how glad I am that it's me sitting here in this jail and not you. There's a lot of suffering to be entered into in this world. The kind of suffering, that Christ, the kind of suffering Christ takes on. I welcome the chance to take my share in the church's part of that suffering. When I became a servant in this church, I experienced the suf suffering as a sheer gift, God's way of helping me serve you, laying out the whole truth. This mystery has been kept in the dark for a long time, but now it's out in the open. God wanted everyone, not just Jews, to know 
this rich and glorious secret inside and out, regardless of their background, regardless of the religious status. The mystery in a nutshell is this, Christ is in you. So therefore, you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. That is the substance of our message. We preach Christ, warning people not to add to the message. We teach in a spirit of profound common sense so that we can bring each person to maturity. To be mature is to be basic Christ. No more, no less. That's what I'm working so hard at day after day, year after year, doing my best with the energy God so generously gives me. So whatever it is that stood out for you, just take a minute. If you're a note taker, feel free to write in a journal or a piece of paper. If you want to just sit and close your eyes and just come before Jesus, you can do that. Ask him a question about that word or phrase and how it might apply to what we're talking about today. Is there a command in the midst of it, a message, a promise, an understanding, or is there a sin he needs to deal with? I just come before you and as I think about my life I'm not speaking for anyone here just me uh, I want to be known particularly before you as one who invests as who one who sees life in this journey the highs the lows even the suffering it's an opportunity to be sanctified further the last line of that reading hit me today. I'm doing my best, God. I want to do my best. And I'm so grateful that in this moment, I'm reminded that I'm standing here with not only you, the one who is above all, or as the prayer we read at the very beginning of our service, where Christ above, beneath, beside, to my right, to my left, before, behind, but that you are also Christ in me. So today, and in this week, for me, and for anyone who wants to join me in this, help me, help us to be investors who live this life as an opportunity to be further set apart, sanctified, to grow in our ability to become like you. Knowing that you're in me motivates me, motivates us to press on. In your name.